what a day! What a lovely day! <laughs> Welcome to the Mad Max Minute Podcast, the daily podcast where we break down Mad Max one minute at a time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minute 56, which begins with Jesse caressing Max's abs, and it ends <laughs> with the Rockatansky family van pulling into a mechanic's shop. I feel like every minute should start with Jesse caressing Max's abs. I was say, I do feel like Joanne Samuel is a strong enough actress to tackle that task. Yes. I feel like she can handle she it. Is, she is worthy of it. <laughs> I say, the whole first half of this minute is just tied over from what we were talking about on Friday. Yes. More of Max and his feelings that he can't express. Hmm. And he's really finishing a thought that he kind of got into. He, he spoke last week about how He's not sure that he ever really told his father how proud of him that he was. And he continues that on this week by saying, or how good it felt just to be there alongside him, which I think really lends back to the idea that Max's love language is quality time. Ooh, nice. The fact that his just spending time around his father Mm -hmm. was, you know, enough for him. Yes, That he didn't have to come right out and say that he had love for his father because the way he showed it was by spending time with him. Yes, absolutely. And I got to wonder if he's like that because I think his dad was like that too. That his dad specifically would take Max out on long walks and they would spend that quality time together. And I think that's probably where he picked it up. And it's significant in this moment because Max says, you know, even now when I think back on it, I still feel and then he just trails off. Yes, he can't he can't even say even after all this buildup where he's made it very clear that it made him feel happy. He still can't say it made me feel happy. Yeah, he just can't. It's like a block. Like he a can't mental say block. it. And. I know we're kind of talking about this and and Max's blocked feelings kind of in a negative way, but we all know how he's feeling right now. Like he has something he wants to say that he knows he needs to say. He has to say it, but he can't. In whatever sense, we've all had those moments where we have had to do something, but you just can't get over that hurdle of actually saying it. And once you do get over that hurdle, like you spill over it. Mm -hmm. But it's just that moment. You just have to pass that moment. And right now, he fails that moment. Yeah. And he moves on. (laughs) Instead of jumping over this emotional hurdle, he just kind of goes around it and heads off in another direction. Yes. Because he continues by saying, The thing is, Jess, I couldn't tell him about it then, but I can tell you about it now. I don't want to wait 10 years to tell you how I'm feeling about you right now. And then he kind of gets interrupted by Jesse. But... He is so bound and determined to find a way to actually come right out and say what he's feeling. And I think that this is kind of spurred on by the fact that he just lost Goose. Absolutely. He's getting face-to-face with the idea of mortality. We talked a little bit about this when we were watching the beach scene. But, you know, Max has been reminded that he is in a dangerous job and that in the blink of an eye, it could all go away. Yes, and... We we get the sense, it's not confirmed, but pretty much his, that his dad is gone. Mm-hmm. And so his dad is gone, and now Goose is gone. He doesn't want to look back after Jesse is gone in a couple of days and not have told her. Mm-hmm. And it now occurs to me that this scene was included, and this scene is so important because it's not that long that they have left together. Yeah. In their world, I think it's only a couple of days. Minute 74. Yes. Spoiler alert. In our world, we have plenty of time to pick apart their relationship. Yeah. Um, But in their world, nope. I gotta say, if you want to start a countdown clock, (laughs) we're on minute 56. (laughs) Something terrible happens in minute 74. I find it fascinating when you know that a character is going to die. I do this a lot with Harry Potter Mm -hmm. because a lot of the characters die. But I do it specifically with Fred. Can I I say it? Snape kills Dumbledore. (laughs) Okay. 
I guess, spoiler alert. (laughs) Take that, Harry Potter minute. (laughs) Okay, I do this a lot with Fred. So I know that Fred is going to die, and I know when he dies and how, and all of that stuff. So when I go back and read the book or listen to the audiobook to prior to that, I pay specific attention to the interactions that Fred has with the people around him, specifically with George. Mm -hmm. And I think in my head, like... Right now, he doesn't know that he has less than a year to live. And and I don't know. I find that kind of thinking fascinating. And the same thing with Dumbledore. Like, through that entire book, six, he has less than a year to live. Mm-hmm. And these are the things that he's doing with it. Difference being, Dumbledore knows that he has less than a year to live. Fred has no idea. So, looking at it this way, for Mad Max, Jesse only has a few days to live. So, to have this conversation with Max... To have so many opportunities to express her love for him and for him to go out of his comfort zone and try so hard to say out loud how he feels about her Mm -hmm. really means a lot. Yeah, it does. You know, in media, movies, TV shows, when somebody passes, you see their loved ones say things like, if I had known that that was the last conversation I was going to have... I would have had it differently. Mm -hmm. Or the last conversation that a pair had was a fight. And then one of them dies. The other one is like guilt ridden because that's the last time that, you know, that they saw them and spoke to them and it was angry. So getting to have this conversation so close to her death, I think is really powerful when you think about it that way. Yeah. And kind of reiterates that you should have conversations like that now. Mm-hmm. because you never know. And even if you do your best to have honest, open conversations, your last conversation with somebody could still be a fight. Right. You're never going to be able to control that because life is unpredictable. But if you make sure that you have the meaningful conversations as well, then things balance out. Yeah, because there's nothing worse than being racked with guilt over things not said. Right. And I think Max in the scene is like, pre-racking himself with guilt over things not said to Jesse because he's equating that with how he feels about his dad. Yeah. You get the real sense here that all of the things that Max is thinking about his father, that was all left unsaid. Yes. Like it's... And he, yeah, he uses... Very clear. He uses the story as kind of a parable Mm -hmm. of what he doesn't want to happen. He's learning the lesson. Parables are stories that are meant to teach lessons. And he's learning the lesson and taking it to heart. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, he gets close. He gets he so just, close. He just gets, like we said before, that mental hurdle. And there is something that we as viewers want him to say. We want him to get to the end of his little story here and just say, Jesse, I love you. Yes. Four words. Her name, I love you. And I'm like, okay, I don't feel like watching the movie again. I'm going to do a a word find search in the (laughs) subtitles that I have downloaded. And so I did a word search for the word love. And it comes up three times in this hour and a half movie. The first and second time it comes up are in minutes 17 and 18. The first time the word love is used is Barry, the mechanic. The second (laughs) time it's used is Goose. And at both times, it's in reference to how Max feels about the black on black. They're saying to the group assembled, he loves it. You know, he's in love with the car. Yes. The th- which, I, which speaks more to future movies where the replacement love of his life after losing the first one is the car. Yeah. And so the third time it's used is actually... A little bit down the road in minute 64 when Jesse is heading off to the beach and she invites Max to come along and he says, I'd love to, but I've got to stay and work on the car. Again, he's putting a car before his wife. Yeah, but fixing up the car is... It's also It's an act of service. It's an act of service. Yeah. Yes. So it's a little bit of that service love language seeping in here. Yes. Um, I'm glad. I'm so glad you looked up the five love languages because it's such an interesting way to evaluate an on-screen couple. Yes. I, I wish that I had thought about it sooner. That's all right. When you do 90 some odd episodes for a single movie. Right. You know. You're going to figure things out halfway through. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so he never says I love you. Nope. And there are different ways, like different words mm-hmm. to use to say I love you. Yeah. I mean, there's the instance where Jesse Jesse goes out to send Max off to work and she does her 
weird hand signal thing says that she's crazy about him. And he reciprocates that back. Probably in that same minute I just mentioned, minute 64, um, we'll get there when we get to it. But like they have other ways of sharing how they feel about each other. And I like that Jess E, and I feel like this was her thinking, was able to realize how hard it is for Max to share his feelings. And so she came up with something goofy as a way, as an easier way for him to share his feelings about her. Because even though, and this is down the road, I'm getting out of the minute here, he is kind of clumsy with it. It doesn't feel natural to him, but he's still able to look at her and tell her verbally that he's crazy about her. Yes. Just the same way that she did earlier in the movie. Yes. It's kind of a her providing him with a shorthand. Right. To she get does that seem out. to she definitely understands how hard it is. Well, he's telling her how hard it is. Yeah. Like I, I think wish... I think she already knew and this is him just right. saying it I, out I loud. I think their relationship never would have progressed to marriage if she didn't understand in other ways Mm -hmm. how he felt that he was in love with her. Yeah. And I wish that, I think they would have benefited from analyzing their love languages. Mm -hmm. Because if they were both able to understand what Max's love language is, I don't think he would have put so much pressure on himself in this scene to say the words I love you. Yeah. Now, that being said, no matter what your love language is, you still have to say I love you. Yeah. Like you have to articulate clearly. You can you can say it in whatever love language you feel like and whatever combination of love languages you feel like, but you still have to say the words I love you. Mm-hmm. It's just it's part of having a committed relationship where love is present. You have to say it to each other. And I don't think that love languages replaces saying simply I love you. Yeah, because it is a simple phrase. It's the weight behind it. That makes it complicated. And I think in this situation, it's just Max overthinking it. Yes, I do think he's overthinking it. Which really, there's no reason for him not to say it. Right. Like, he's he's been married to this woman for who knows how long. They have a child together. I mean, everything he does, he does for them. Yes. I think he's overthinking it because he doesn't realize that he already communicates his love. Mm Mm-hmm. With his quality time. He needs to say I love you. But it doesn't have to have the weight of their, you know, however many years, seven. It doesn't have to have the weight of all seven years of their relationship. Yeah. It just needs to be right now, I love you. Yeah. I find it interesting, though, that as he's struggling to say something out loud, Jesse takes control of the situation and she ends up kissing him. Yes. She eases his burden. Yeah. Which is, it's what you do mm-hmm. in a relationship, in a partnership. You you work to ease each other's burdens. So I'm kind of torn on this because I think it is important for him to say I love you. I think she did kind of... Give him an leave. easy way out. Yeah, give him an easy out. But it's also part of her job to 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 carry his burdens, to to do what he can't. Yeah, and not so much carry his burdens just because she's a wife, but also just carry his burdens as a romantic partner. Absolutely. As someone who is romantically connected to right. Max yes. and has committed her life to him, you know, yes. as one individual to another. Absolutely. And Max, I think he is weighed down by the burdens that he carries, mm-hmm. trying to protect her from the realities of his job. Yeah, because he deals with some pretty horrific stuff. Yes, and he definitely carries all of that burden himself. And you can only carry so much. So she takes this. Yeah, I went online and I was looking at different articles about the importance of sharing feelings. And I didn't pick one out specifically just because, you know, they were just so myriad. But there was one analogy that I liked and that is people are like glass jars and feelings are like rocks and when you don't share your feelings you're holding all of those rocks inside the glass jar and at some point the jar is going to be filled too much with the rocks and it's going to break the glass and that's you know when people have emotional meltdowns or you know explode and overreact and all that other stuff and it's important to take those rocks out every once in a while by communicating with another person Mm, in order to kind of keep yourself from you know exploding like on a daily basis I will I will take things that bother me, like little stuff, 
not even big stuff. And instead of like expressing them, expressing them, mm-hmm. and instead of expressing them, I'll bury them deep down because it's just how I am. But like, but then I get behind the wheel of a car and my <laughs> friends have really noticed this. That all of my chill kind of goes out the window Yeah. when I get behind that's the wheel you, of a car. That's where you express your emotions. Yeah. And, I mean, you think of Max, and, yeah, he spends most of his life on the road as a police officer, but I think he's just so focused on the situation that that's not really a release for him. No, and we've noted before how stoic he is Yeah. when he's doing police work. We don't see a lot of emotion on his face. Mm -hmm. We don't see him reacting dramatically. I mean, even when, back when he saw the Knight Rider crash and explode. Yeah. There was a little bit of reaction on his face, a little bit of like disbelief at what he was seeing, but not that much. Yeah. It was very, very minor. And he didn't debrief about that situation. He didn't talk about what he saw. No, I don't think so. He never talked about the Knight Rider crash. He never talked to Jesse about what happened between Goose and Johnny. Mm -hmm. Like that was a high stress situation. Right. With a lot of flared emotions. And Max never shares that with her because he's so adamant about dividing his work and his family. Yes. And making sure that she's not burdened with any of that. I think that what we've seen and that we noted in the previous few minutes, I'm looking back at my notes, I think it was minute 54 where we see them, yeah, the montage, Mm -hmm. where we see them in the car and they're relaxed and joking and happy and we see them buy a dog and go swimming. This is the prep work. That Mm -hmm. is relaxing him and putting his work behind him to get him to a place where now in minutes 55 and 56, he's telling this story that is very, that's emotional. It makes him happy. It also fills him with some regret. Yeah. That brings us to this point where he's trying to say, these memories make me happy and you and, and Jesse, I love you. Yeah. So we've seen the prep work. And I think it's kind of too bad that it doesn't exactly pay off. Mm -hmm. I think it does. I think the two of them have communicated to each other and they both understand. But as a viewer, you still want that little extra. Right. I think the point was he needs to say, I love you. Yeah. Like, I'm sure his dad knew that the time they spent together made Max happy. But Max never told him that. There's a difference between understanding something and being told something. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I I love this time that they take to just build up this relationship between Max and Jesse. Yes. Max and Jesse, just the idea of them. Like, it's a bright spot in this movie. Yes. We got... We got a glimpse into their relationship at the very beginning. And then we went a really long time without seeing Jesse. And I felt her absence. Mm -hmm. Every, like, few movie minutes analyzing them. So every few days for me. I'd be like, we have, I feel like it's been a really long time since we've seen Jesse. We've been doing police work for a really long time. I want to get back to her. Yeah. Because Jesse is the kind of person that when she's around, Max is happier. Yes. It's like when um, like when I asked Kyle to be my best man, he didn't really know you, but he saw when you were around, it made me happier. Yes. Like Kyle was able to see that as an outsider. Yes. I mean, granted, after we got married, we started hanging around with them more often and all that stuff. But at the time, that's how it was. Yes. And that's exactly what you see with Max and Jesse here. Like when she is in his vicinity, he's happier. Absolutely. In a way that he was not happy with Goose around. Like, it was a different sort of happiness. Yes, absolutely a different sort of happiness. This seems much more thorough. Mm -hmm. Which makes it all the more tragic. The... Which makes the end of the movie all the more tragic and does a lot to explain his character in the upcoming movies. Right. That losing her broke something inside of him. (laughs) Yeah. Because having her and having that relationship created something whole inside of him. That's all going to go away. Yeah. Minute 74. Yep. Countdown continues. Countdown continues. So before we transition out of this scene, because I do feel like it's an abrupt transition, she goes in to kiss him and then it's like before a satisfying amount of time has passed, we're on to the next thing. But yeah. before we transition out of this, um, there was an interesting th- thing that you noticed about yeah. Mel Gibson's performance. There was a little something and I had to watch it several times to decide. 
He drops his accent. Um, something. What's the last line? The years? Ten years? He what's says, that line? I don't want to wait ten years to tell you how I'm feeling about you right now. Yes. And right about years, he drops his accent. It's thoroughly American. Yeah. <laughs> and that made me wonder, and I have to admit, we did not do any prep work, so we're going to look it up. I know that he was not born in Australia, which blew my mind. I thought he was thoroughly no... No variation Australian, but he was born in New York. So I'm curious about when did he move to Australia? Are his parents Australian who happened to be living in New York when he was born? So, Or are his parents American and happened to move to Australia and take him there? So Mel Gibson was born in Peekskill, New York, and moved with his parents to Sydney, Australia when he was 12. That's kind of old. Yeah. That's not what I like pictured in my head. For like what I've always thought of as a native born son, Mm -hmm. you know, I had, this is complete news to me. So it looks like, yeah. His heritage is Irish. So yeah, he was the son of Hutton Gibson and Irish born and Patricia. So his mom was full on Irish. Ah, His paternal grandmother was an opera contralto. That's kind of cool. Oh, Ava yeah. Mylott, who was born in Australia to Irish parents, while his paternal grandfather, John Hutton Gibson, was a millionaire tobacco businessman in the American South. Oh, um, wow. Okay, so they're just really all over yeah. the place. So Gibson's father, Hutton, was awarded $145,000 in a work-related injury lawsuit against the New York Central Railroad in 1968, and that's when they relocated to Australia. Oh, okay. So he got a ton of money because yeah. he got hurt on the job. Yeah. And then they moved and to then Australia. And they moved back to Australia. Which, hey, if you're going to move so, to Australia. It's kind of hard to say if he's like a native, you know, if his heritage is Australian because it's part American, part Irish, part Australian. Yeah. I think because he spent so much time going to school as a teenager in he Australia. He picked up the accent. That's really where he picks it up. And he also, acting school was also in Australia. Exactly. So, all of his teachers and his fellow students had Australian accents. Yeah, we talked a bit about that yes. when we were talking about Steve Bisley. Okay. Um, Aus- and it, that also helps explain why now he has absolutely no trace yeah. of an Australian accent. <laughs> I love when actors, I think it happens a lot with Australian actors, simply because the most common accents in movies are British and American accents. So when, a, when an Australian actor, Hugh Jackman, for example, does like Wolverine, with an American accent, and then you hear him, like, talking, like, in interviews and stuff. It's so surprising to hear an Australian accent. Yeah. Um, but it's just not, it's not Mel Gibson. He does not have an accent anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm sure he can, if he wanted to. Yeah, I'm sure he still has that in the back pocket somewhere. Yeah. Um, one last thing, and I've been holding off mentioning this this whole time. <laughs> What's that? Um, now that we're transitioning out of this scene, I can, I can say it, oh. drop it, and run. <laughs> Mel Gibson's got tiny nipples. Just gonna say it. Go back, watch okay. it, and just you and know, just stare at his nipples for a minute thirty four seconds. He's got one right on display there. The yep. other one, I think, is under Jesse's head. But he's got this, this tiny, tiny little little, little baby pepperoni size. <laughs> okay, but that's enough of that because, like I said, we are transitioned very quickly into the next scene where G- Max and Jesse are just kind of driving along this dirt road through a bunch of junked cars, um, and then they pull up to a mechanic's shop. Yes. Um, This area, um, I looked on MadMaxMovies.com, got the location information. They used the Craigie Burn Auto Wreckers uh, as the wrecking yard that we see here that they drive into. The buildings were still there until around the mid-2000 dots. Um, At that time, the office that the Grease Rat comes out of, that gets demolished. This area is very similar to like the Fat Nancy's Diner Mm -hmm. Cafe set in that it's pretty much private property at this point so it's gated off really hard to get into right not very good for like google street view stuff yeah but i don't know if you're gonna take a tour of movie locations i'm not sure this is really on the list yeah there's no Eh. junked cars around there anymore it's really cleared out and kind of disappointing um but as they pull up to this uh oh what were you gonna say i i was just gonna say i appreciated like the logo sign that said you bend them we mend them yeah Give me a laugh. I did Google it. Uh, I'm not sure what I was expecting, but there are just tons of auto body shops all over the country uh, that use that logo. So no surprise there. It's a popular saying. Yes. So after we see that sign, they pull up to the mechanic shop and the proprietor has come out. He's the, uh, the mechanic's grease rat. 
I don't buy that. Now, you didn't sing it. <laughs> no, I'm not going to sing it. Uh, I set you up saying it melodically. You let me down. I did let you down. Anyway, so this Grease Rat that we see come out of the office, he is played by Nick Lothoris, who has a top four on IMDb. So obviously, number one is Mad Max, where he played the Grease Rat. Uh, in 1990, he was in a movie called Death in Brunswick, where he played Mustafa. Um, there's a spoiler that I could say about this movie. Um, but I mean, the movie's title is Death in Brunswick, and I'm not sure how much of a spoiler it would be if if I told you that the death in the title is Nick Lothoris's character. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, considering I just I've, said it, so I guess right. spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, uh, considering that I've never heard of the movie, I think you can spoil it. Yeah, um, Sam Neill kills him. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, Doctor Grant from Jurassic Park comes over and kills the mechanic from Mad Max. <laughs> um, his number three top movie is Where the Green Ants Dream from 1984. He plays Arnold. Uh, it is, or I should say. Where the Green Ants Dream is a movie about, like, a corporation that wants to come in and, like, redevelop land that belongs to a bunch of aborigines. And so it's the story of them fighting this corporation for the land. And um, it's got Nick Lathoris as, I think he plays, like, a lawyer or something like that. I think uh, Bruce Spence is in it, too. We won't see him until the next movie, though. I watched the trailer and I was like, hey, I recognize some of those faces. Because it's Australia. Because it's Australia, exactly. <laughs> they only have so many actors. Um, the number four movie is The Heartbreak Kid from 1993. He plays a character named George. Um, Nick Lathoris has racked up 31 acting credits between 1971 and 2001. Um, he was on six episodes of The Flying Doctors between 1987 and 1988. And he was in one episode of Water Rats, which is the show that Steve Bisley was on. I mentioned that a little while back. Okay. Um Here's the surprising bit, though, because aside from all of his acting jobs, Nick Lathuris is also one of the three screenwriters for Mad Max Fury Road, which blew my mind. Okay, at first it blew my mind, but then once I thought about it for a second, it made sense because the Grease Rat, I'll bet he was responsible for Furiosa and the grease paint all over her face. <laughs> But he was like, throw back to the first movie. There you go. Let's put grease all over her eyes. <laughs> and she'll look awesome and badass. <laughs> well, thank goodness he wasn't like, all right, as a throwback, we got to have someone with a big nose. <laughs> there is someone in that movie with a big nose. Well, I'm sure. But at some point. Yeah. 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 There's a Or there's a as a throwback, like a... let's crush somebody underneath a car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're going to see plenty of him in dialogue in the next couple of minutes yes we don't see too much of him in this minute no just a quick hello yeah they roll up max gets out of the car says hello and grease rats like ah get a load of that and it's like well you know you see the art on the side of that van what yeah else are you gonna i say yeah i was kind of wondering like what exactly he was referring to yeah i mean the the van itself doesn't seem overly impressive to me um but you know I don't know. Could be different. But yeah, Max goes to take the tire off the road. The So Max goes to take the tire off the roof and he just kind of gets out a few words. We'll worry about that tomorrow. Yes. Uh, but aside from them pulling up and Max getting out of the car, I think the dog. Yep. The dog jumps off. out and runs off screen. So who the heck knows yeah, so where he he's probably off just, to. Probably just wants to poke around in the junkyard a little bit. Yeah. But the, the dog being with Max is definitely going to factor into uh, the scenes ahead based on where Jesse decides to go and whatnot, I ah, think. Okay. Yeah, we get to see a little bit of that before the week is out, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Yes. In the meantime, <laughs> our website is madmaxminute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Mad Max Minute and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash madmaxminute. Thank you for joining us for Mad Max Minute number 56. We'll see you tomorrow. Motorbikes and leather men Take me to the edge of the dream 